permanent water points, you know, the, tire, uh, the concrete tanks, fixed water points, but we do all the paddock subdivision with temporary fence. So it's, not, it's more of a combination between fixed and flexible. Uh, in the back there. Than 100. Okay, on HDPE pipe, is the 160 PSI even more break resistant than the 100 PSI? In my experience, I would answer that question yes. Uh, and 200 PSI being even more durable than the, the 160. Uh, we should probably have uh, David or Chris or someone accurately and correctly answer that question whether strictly from a, a technology standpoint is there a difference um, I'm not positive but in my experience um, it, it does seem to me that the 160 and the 200 is even more durable than the 125 yeah what's the UV stability the UV stability uh, the pipe that they sell here I believe has a 15 year above the <coughs> And so 30, 15 year above ground, 30 year below ground. So uh, it's pretty stable. With that black pipe above ground during the summertime, um, are you running into issues where the water's getting too hot and the cows aren't drinking as much? Or? Okay, another good question. On black pipe run on the surface, does the water temperature get too hot for the, uh, the cows to, or any kind of stock to drink it? When, again, when we were up at Linnaeus, we had a lot of these systems out and we did some studies on um, assessment of water temperature at different times of the day, different lengths of pipe going to the tanks. And um, the only time that the water temperature, we, we were recording water temperatures at 8 a.m., noon, 4 p.m., and 8 p.m. And the 4 p.m. water temperature in the pipe um, that was the only time the temperature got to a point that I would have been concerned about uh, animal consumption. In the tank itself, the water is cooler. The animal starts drinking, hot water flows in. Initially, it's being diluted by the cooler tank water that's in the tank. Um, and then you also do the calculus. We were using, in that, that case, just three-quarter inch pipe. Uh, and I don't remember, but it's up around like uh, 100 feet of pipe to have one gallon in a three-quarter inch <coughs> pipe. And so if you had a thousand foot of pipe out there, you would only have 10 gallons of water in the pipe. It flows into the tank. Uh, it's being diluted. Shortly after that 10 gallons flows in, you've got cooler water coming in again. Uh, and that is if the pipe is laying on the surface. As soon as it starts settling into ground contact, you get some duff and debris over it. Uh, basically, bottom line, I guess the fast answer I should have given, after the system has been in more than six months, it was zero factor. There was, I mean, no, it's not a factor, except when you first put it in. Okay, we need to move along here. Uh, again, portable fence, if you use the right tools, it's easy work. Um, Again, for, we've been using the uh, gear, the O'Brien reels. We started using the O'Brien reels in the late 1980s. We started using the O'Brien step-ins in the like, late 1980s. We have used just about every brand of post, every brand of reel there is, and this is what we've always come back to. They're, in, in my opinion, they're the best tools available. If uh, I don't run out of time, uh, I'll give an actual comparison of what we did on some different time factors. Again, the three to one reels. Some people like to be mobile. I enjoy walking. It's part of why we configure grazing cells the way we do, so that it's easy to walk everything through. Uh, if you don't like walking and you need to mechanize yourself, that's just fine. People have figured out different ways of, you know, post holders, uh, reel winders, different stuff. This one here, I do want to say something about. Uh, some people. This is just a cordless, a mounted reel, mounted spool, cordless reel. You can roll up poly wire in a hurry that way. It'll cut the life of your poly wire in half, typically, though, by dragging it to you rather than walking with it. 
Now, that was with twisted poly wires. The braided stuff is a lot more durable, less problematic, and yeah, you can probably uh, re mechanically reel up the braided material from PowerFlex and have it last longer than um, twisted products. A lot of you have gotten the, the O'Brien reels, whether it's PolyFlex, PowerFlex, or O'Brien. If you put a power winder on a geared reel, it will void the warranty. And they will be able to tell that you have done it. So that's something to keep in mind also. So we look at these flexible designs, advantages, you've got maximum management flexibility. Again, you got everything you from a two paddock to a two hundred paddock opportunity, lower initial capital cost. Works well on rented land. If you're renting land and leasing, you know, one of the big issues is what can you afford to invest in leased land to manage it more effectively? And usually the answer is not very much. By taking uh, a real flexible approach, minimizing any permanent tanks you put on the place, minimizing buried pipelines, minimizing any permanent tank installations. If you lose the lease on that farm, you just take the toys and go somewhere else and it becomes cost effective to manage leased land uh, very effectively. Disadvantages, more daily labor required because you are moving fence and tanks about. Uh, I want to, again, I'll say a little more about that here shortly. And you have more maintenance. Anytime you say temporary, portable, movable, there's going to be more maintenance. Again, going back to when we first started in Idaho, the Yelp came down and knocked our temporary fences down every night, you know, for two to three weeks. We put them back up all the time. We trained the Yelp to not bother them. And we just don't have a life, uh, wildlife problem with our fences anymore because we train them. When you start setting up these corridors, uh, because another area that I think is real important is uh, past record keeping, keeping, feed planning, and feed budgeting uh, out into the future. And one of the problems a lot of guys have is not really knowing how many acres they're working with in particular areas. So when we set up these uh, flexible systems with grazing corridors, we like using, you know, particular widths here. Anybody know why I would like a width of 435 feet? It's a fraction of an acre. If you put your line post in, your power flex post in at 50 foot post spacing, every increment between posts is a half acre. So 435, well that doesn't always work out there, but guess what? You can take, uh, and this is a picture doesn't let me just go to that next one. Again, I'm not sure how good this is. This is a, a farm we set up actually in Florida in a flexible system, and he's got the grazing quarters here, 400 feet, 400 feet, 410, 410, uh, 280, 300. Everything is split to create the two corridors, and if you wanted to, between each of your permanent line post spacings, have a half acre on a 400 foot corridor, it's 54 feet, 500 foot, it's 43, 600 feet, 72, 854. Basically, as long as you know 43,560 square feet is an acre, and you know what the width of your corridor is, do a little forward planning. Just don't automatically put every post in at 50 feet. You have these different corridors there, use different post spacings and try to set it up so that in every situation, the space between two posts is the same. And that's the way this place is set up, is every, every, in every one of these fields, his line post spacing basically designates a half acre. Now, you've got some that are slanted. This is, you know, just 200 feet here, out to 580 feet. You can't get it all the time, but if you can get two-thirds, three-fourths, 80 percent, of your pasture set up in such a way that the fence post spacing means something to you, that makes feed budgeting a whole lot easier, it makes your record keeping a whole lot easier, and you can monitor and tell how fast you're feeding, feeding out. So put a little forethought into the plan. Okay, I want to, what, what's our time here, sir? Quarter still, fantastic. Connie might not have to get after me today, we'll see. Uh, we're going to travel around the country now, look at some different grazing cells to think about these concepts uh, where we, we've been dealing with. I hope everyone in this room recognizes that there's nothing here that you can take home and exactly reproduce on your place because your place is different. 
We're just giving you, you know, the, the guidelines and concepts, things that we have found that work. We're going to start at our farm up in North Missouri, which I built largely as a fixed system. Uh, we came on to this place in 1983 and started uh, actually just just this part up here, and then we started adding to it. And I think we bought this last 20 acres in 1989. So it's 260 acres. I actually had it fenced into 76 permanent pastures. I mean, I just got carried away on fencing because, I mean, high tensile fencing is so easy, affordable. You know, I just went out and did it. Um, initially, we didn't have to pipeline water. We had these ponds, and uh, there was a, there's a lane that runs all the way down to here. And a lot of times, you know, we were going to clear back the ponds up here. The water, we lay kind of a spoke system around this pond here. Uh, this system we did put in before the pipelines. There was, a, again, a lane. These are all, all the red fences. That's permanent high tensile electric fence. Uh, up in this part of the farm, most of it's three wire because we did have sheep. This was all single wire over here. All this back here is single wire. But again, when we first started out, we used this line, and the cattle always came back to this pond for water. You put a lot of manure into the uh, lanes when you do that. You put a lot of wear and tear on the lanes. And so we got around to you know, putting the water system in place so that they didn't have to do that. So that's what I actually did. This is the actual finished layout of our farm there. You'll notice these fields back here, uh, I didn't split up. We were grazing, we were using these as a flexible system, just single watering points and strip grazing away from them. If I were to go back up to that bare piece of land and do it again, and again, just kind of look at the concentration of red lines there, that's how I would do it if I were starting over. Uh, basically, I'm just creating corridors that are six, no, no wider than 660 feet. Uh, this is an 80 here, so that's 660, this is 660, 660. There's actually a woodland here, so this one would only be a couple hundred feet. Uh, basically, I have nowhere that is further than 660 feet to pull a temporary fence across. Uh, rather than putting in permanent you know, watering tanks, I just have a whole lot more quick coupler valve attachments out there and use movable tanks. I have probably a third of the money invested in the fence, maybe even only a quarter of the money invested in the fence, if I did an approach like this, the pipeline cost would be about the same, but I wouldn't have as many permanent tank installations, and I would have so much more flexibility on how to utilize, you know, different parts of the farm at different times. So that's kind of, after 25 plus years of experience doing this, I do a whole lot more flexible fence. Yes, sir. Back to the freezing part with the portable tanks in the wintertime when the few days a year where it's just okay. so nasty cold, how do, you, how do you get the portable tanks full? Okay. Um, I, I would still have buried all the lines. And I didn't draw them in, but I would put in just a few key uh, locations that had year round waters in it so that I always had that fallback point of going to, because again, I don't care if they're walking a mile in the winter to go to water. Uh, temporary tanks, again, in, in a lot of Missouri, you can use movable tanks with flowing water a good part of the winter, because we don't have real winter like they do further north or out west or places. All right, so there's the concept that we create parallel corridors with water locations around. This is where we are in Idaho now, in Circle Pie Ranch. This is the Patterson unit. We're just one unit of a, a larger ranch. Uh, we're 6,000 foot elevation. The main ranch is at 5,000 foot. Uh, two circle pivots that we use. This one is 300 acres. Our whole farm in Missouri was 260 acres. We go up on the side of the mountain here and look down on that and say, there's no way that that's bigger than what our whole farm was, but it is. Uh, so there's 300 acres there. From the pivot center to the outer reach is 2,040 feet. The little pivot is 150 acres, and it's 1,460 feet. When we first came and started managing this unit, there was no internal fence on any of these. The only stock water was available at the pivot center. So, uh, and 